Well, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all here today. You are split into left and right, <laughs> or right and left. And um, I would like to especially thank Carol and the staff at the McMaster Museum of Art for their excellent work on behalf of this exhibition, which you can see as you move around the space contains a lot of reading. And uh, reading rooms have been part of my practice for three decades. And there is a book that I produce called Reading Rooms uh, with some information on the particular strategies that I engaged in over the years, uh, which is uh, in developing a system of open reading. And if you know Umberto Eco, he actually wrote an essay on open reading and what that constitutes. So I won't go in here on to greater extent to take up the important space that we have here for my colleagues, your colleagues, teachers, uh, Virginia, James, and Neil, who will lead the discussion with thoughts of their own on Bertrand Russell and uh, what his work brings to contemporary life. And these two videos over here are an attempt to, uh, to make his work come alive again and to not to decanonize <coughs> him, but he's already been canonized. And as Virginia said to me just before this Recanonized and recanonized, and of course, um, many of his texts are now PDFs online that you can download freely. Uh, not a lot of people, well, certainly more people now know that he spent six months in Brixton prison for his anti-war work, his uh, his writings, and. Um, one of the reasons for introducing this, affirming this, was to say that uh, there is a writing and reading room next door, and there's also a writing and reading room here uh, when the doors were closed. And he wrote some 60 letters, which McMaster University and uh, the archive has put up online. And I encourage you all to read those letters, uh, as I have and enjoyed uh, what he was writing in 1918 to family, friends, lovers, and the governor of the prison, one of which is on that video there. Please give me more space. I need more books. I need to be able to write properly. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to pass this microphone over to Virginia, and she will uh, speak on a particular topic relating to the exhibition of Bertrand Russell. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, everybody else. Where is she? Vivian? I saw her here. <laughs> uh, war does not determine who is right, only who is left. From the League of Nations to the end game in Syria. Picking up on Bruce Barber's choice of exhibit, especially the video on refugees right there, if you need to watch it after I'm done, I want to explore those left behind in the Middle East and Balkans. For those of you who do not know, I have spent much of my life studying the Ottoman Empire, which was the Middle East before the 20th century, and written laterally on war and violence in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Ottoman Empire collapsed in 1918, and a series of solutions to the territorial problems emerged, driven by the League of Nations, such as the lightly cloaked French and British colonialism of the Arab mandates, including Palestine and or the Greek-Turkish War that produced the two states of Turkey and Greece, or Bulgaria, Serbia, Romania, where communism and the long series of wars in the Balkans continue to be part of the legacy of events stemming from the 1870s. In its centennial years, World War I has been revisited by countless historians and produced a plethora of new books, 
bringing, in some instances, the Middle East battlefronts in, more directly into the story and moving beyond the great heroic tale of the Lawrence of Arabia, which heretofore was the story of the Middle East from 1914 to 1918. There are many historians who now consider the 1912-13 events in the Balkans when the Ottomans fought Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, etc., as the crucible of World War I. There is also some consensus that the Middle East, East Europe writ large, suffered more casualties than any other region of the world in World War I. Brief examples to give you an idea. This is from Wikipedia, pardon me. <laughs> if Canada's losses amounted to 0.8 to 9% of its population, and the UK 1.9 to 2.23% of its population, Russia 1.6 to 1.9, Germany 3.3 to 4.32%, etc. Serbia lost 17 to 28% of its population, and Turkey and the Arab countries, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, etc., 13 to 15%. The word refugee existed before World War I, but an international consensus did not. In 1921, the League of Nations formed the Commission of Refugees, and thereafter, to be part of an international asylum system, one had to be recognized by an international body. Words like stateless, persecution outside the country of his nationality, fearful, unwilling to return, inform the definition of refugees from that period. The first charge was the million and a half people who fled the Russian Revolution of 1917, followed by the million Armenian refugees who fled Eastern Anatolia. Prior to World War I, one estimate of Muslims fleeing Europe, Balkans, Russia, puts it at five million between 1860 and 1900. The Balkan Wars, 1912-13, puts the death and forced exiles of Muslims into Ottoman territories at 1.5 million. To put that in perspective, <clears throat> total population estimates for the Ottoman remaining territories in 1918 was 20 to 30 million total. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1930, in the first resettlement agreement between twin states, ethnic cleansing of another sort, 500,000 Muslim Greek-speaking Turks were exchanged for 1.5 Christian Turkish speaking Greeks. And you cannot tangle that one, it's a good one. By the 1923 Treaty of Lausanne and the international community. The United States enacted regulations in the early 1920s restricting Southern Europeans and Jews largely, in spite of the fact that some 25% of the Americans who enlisted in World War I were hyphenated citizens. Muslims were simply not a category on anyone's radar in North America, with very few exceptions. In Canada, we accepted many people from the Middle East with Ottoman passports. The large Greek and Armenian communities of Toronto come from that period, but Jews and Muslims were really unwelcome until after World War II. Creation of internment camps, such as the refugee cities of today, were not a common feature of the landscape until the end of World War II when Europe had 40 million refugees. The United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, run by the Allies from 1943 to 47, repatriated some seven million and established refugee camps for another million displaced persons. DP became part of our international vocabulary after World War II and there are a lot probably of descendants in this room of DP families. <clears throat> in 1951, a refugee convention was passed by the international community and the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees was created and our modern definition evolved. The definition is based on the understanding of a state system and a citizen living outside his national state who is unable or unwilling to return, but as the High Commission has evolved, the definition has expanded to include internally displaced persons. All co although contention, contentious at its creation and continues to be, UNHCR has survived till today to address international refugee crises all over the world, where creation of permanent refugee camps 
has become rather the norm than the exception. To understand the scope, UNHCR is active in 128 countries. I will quote a few statistics, which you have actually in your film. From the latest report, 68 million refugees divided as follows, 40 million internally displaced, 25.4 million refugees, <coughs> refugees and 3.1 million asylum seekers, an unprecedented number in human history. The top refugee hosting countries are Pakistan, Iran, Lebanon, Uganda, and Turkey. And 57% of the 25 million refugees come from three countries, South Sudan, Afghanistan, and Syria. This brings me back to the Middle East. In 1949, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, for Palestine refugees in the Near East, was established to shelter the estimated 5 million inhabitants who fled or were expelled in the 1948 and 1967 Arab-Israeli wars. Jews were included in that number, but were largely resettled in Israel, which means that the permanent refugee camps, numbering 5.5 million at the moment in Gaza, West Bank, and elsewhere, are largely Muslim and Christian Palestinians, largely supported by UNRWA, which operates entirely outside the UNHCR mandate and relies on international funding. Two minutes. That unsolved UN dilemma from 1949 to 50 leads us directly to Idlib, Syria today, where another estimated three million Syrians will be tossed into the displaced persons category if Russia, Iran, and their minion, they've established now a uh, uh, no, no war zone. Anyway, I won't go there. <clears throat> I note that Trump has recently abandoned UNRWA funding, and Canada has flip-flopped on the question of funding, with Trudeau staying the course for now. In short, the great powers who have a monopoly on violence created the refugee crisis and continue to exacerbate it, while the UN international community struggles to define and contain it. Burton Russell would have us own both sides of those uh, equation. Pacifism is admirable and desirable, but it has to come also with an understanding of our collective responsibility for the violence that generates such human tragedies. Thank you so much. Uh, Bruce's very powerful and moving uh, exhibit inspired me to think about the, the, the role of the intellectual in the university. And I wanted, so I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about public intellectuals and, and McMaster and universities. Second thing, I want to share, and this is more inspired by the prison, <laughs> I want to uh, share a really incredible story about Bertrand Russell and, and a prisoner that he helped get out of prison. Uh, and, and then finally, I want to make a little tribute to, uh, for some of us, uh, uh, Louis Greenspan, who passed away this summer. And so many, many of us just sort of see him as kind of our own <laughs> Bertrand Russell in a way, our own public intellectual. So I want to just kind of draw out some lessons for today based on, on, on Louis. So, um, so this term, like public intellectual, comes from Russell Jacoby, is a historian, American historian. And there was a big kind of debate about that. And, very kind of influential, and we have a humanities public intellectual project here. And in, in Russell's day, it didn't really exist. You sort of like you were an intellectual. You didn't have to be a, a public intellectual because it was kind of uh, not necessary. All intellectuals were public. But it seems to me that the, the, the term public intellectual becomes necessary because uh, universities, as important and as valuable as they are, they tend to take up a lot of the space for the intellectuals as, pe as you sort of see a kind of academic capitalism and professionalism and citation indexes and rankings. And there's a whole bunch of things that take away uh, this sort of, the, the kind of intellectual, or a create, a lower that amount of space for the kind of intellectual that, that Russell was, who spoke on general issues, disarmament, war, human rights. He took chances in a way that maybe academic professionals don't, don't take so much. He lost appointments. He spent time in jail. Uh, he suffered attacks on his reputation because if he's willing to stand up for issues he believed in. It seems to me we need more of this kind of uh, 
uh, activity. And, and, but it has to be updated. So to, to sort of get there, I want to tell a story about Russell's life and someone that I study about, another public intellectual, Eric Fromm. I don't know if many of you knew who Eric Fromm was, but he was a German-Jewish intellectual. He was an original member of the Frankfurt School, what we now call critical theory. He broke into fame writing a book called Escape from Freedom in 1941. It's an analysis of how modernity leads to freedom as well as anxiety, which can lead to fascism. He also has an analysis in, in this work about the role of narcissists and pathological narcissists in creating a uh, political uh, crisis. So maybe that's uh, relevant uh, uh, south of our border. Uh, but uh, Russell admired uh, Escape from Freedom, even though he was uh, you know, nearly 30 years older. So they weren't peers. Uh, but, uh, but they worked together on human rights issues and disarmament from the organization SANE, uh, came out of a book that Eric Fromm wrote called Sane Society. So he was very, very much in, interested in and, uh, nuclear disarmament. Both were involved in dealing behind the scenes with the Berlin crisis and uh, Russell, of course, with the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But Fromm had a second cousin named Heinz Brandt, and he spent 13 years in Nazi prisons. Uh, he was basically a, a left-wing Marxist, uh, he, he was imprisoned, he ended up in, in Auschwitz, and somehow uh, survived all, all of this. And uh, he, he went to uh, work as a political uh, functionary, he was a Marxist, uh, uh, radical, uh, in, in East Germany, and, and, and saw the, the, the problems of the system, and he became a critic of Stalinism. Um, he, he escaped uh, East Germany, and the East Germans basically kidnapped him from West Germany and put him back in jail after all those years. Uh, he was working for a metal unions uh, 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 newspaper, metal union, uh, metal workers union uh, newspaper in 1961. This is what this happened. And then he, he spent three years in East German prisons. Fromm got him out with Bertrand Russell's help. Uh, Russell had leveraged his own fame to create a movement uh, and also his, own, his friendship with Khrushchev. So how did they do this? Anna Lee, who was Brandt's uh, working class German uh, uh, radical wife, was kind of negotiating behind the scenes. Amnesty International, Fromm ended up being one of the major funders for Amnesty International because he, he became famous writing popular books and he gave a lot of the money to Amnesty International, partly inspired by this case mm -hmm. because in 1963 his second cousin was the the, uh, the prisoner of the year, the, the prisoner of conscience uh, because of this. They did a pamphlet, Fromm did a pamphlet. There was compromise and face saving going behind the scenes. They said, well, he'll go back to Sweden. He'll go to Sweden, he won't have to go to, to West Germany. With this, the regime was worried that that would be uh, you know, uh, a, a problem. Uh, and, and Russell uh, basically leveraged his friendship with Khrushchev, which he had, been, had developed over political political uh, campaigns and, and in his letters, he was writing letters to Khrushchev and kind of slipping in this issue as something that, that, that he wanted to see resolved. Uh, one of the lessons was, it seems to me, that uh, there's a need to be principled and take chances. <laughs> but in Brandt's case, uh, because of his beliefs, but also, of course, because of anti-Semitism, uh, both Fromm and, and Russell uh, took many chances. Uh, um, but they also compromised. Russell actually returned a Medal of Honor he gotten from the East German government because of this case, because of the Brandt case. Fromm didn't want him to. He thought that that was sort of like, uh, he would have better leverage if he, if he threatened to do it. So there was a whole kind of issue there. And I wonder sometimes, sometimes when I look at the world today, the polarization that, that's going on, I wonder if, if we need to think a little bit more time about finding the balance between militants and, pr and principles and sort of finding uh, ways of compromising and get things done. I just want to throw that out as maybe a, something to think about. To, to end, I just want to end on sort of like a little tribute to Louis Greenspan, who was an uh, uh, emeritus professor of religious studies. He passed, like I said, he mentioned passed away this summer. He wrote on Russell uh, and published the, the worth reading. I was reading some of, the, some of the things he wrote on Russell's worth looking at. Uh, he, he was very involved in the Russell archives and Russell work scholarship on campus and peace work on campus. Uh, for me, he was more, he was really like, I, I came, uh, I went to uh, graduate school in New York City, but I grew up in Canada. But when I came here at McMaster, <laughs> Louis was always the person I would make me feel like I was uh, around New York intellectuals. He was kind of a, uh, really a kind of a, 
a, a New York intellectual in Toronto or in, in, in Hamilton, and had a major, uh, he had a major legacy for doing political work and speaking his mind on campus. Uh, like uh, Fromm and Russell, uh, Greenspan was well known in his field, in his academic field, he was a careful scholar. But one of the things I loved about uh, uh, Louis, and you know, if you think about not taking away anything from Russell and Fromm, but these sort of global celebrities, uh, Louis was not famous in a sort of celebrity way. He was a local intellectual, and it seems to me that's something that we need more of, to, especially in a kind of social media uh, mediated world. So we have to think about, you don't have to be famous, <laughs> you don't have to be a celebrity to do some public intellectual work. We could be inspired by Russell mm -hmm. and by Fromm and by, by, by Louis in local communities and smaller publics and high schools and uh, social media. Um, obviously, you know, when we talk about this legacy, this great public intellectual le legacy, and it's a problem with this issue, the notion of a public intellectual, what that is. It has a kind of male uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, element to it, and uh, so, uh, and uh, three white guys, two of them are Jewish, we need to expand what it means to be a public intellectual, who gets to be a public intellectual. Uh, women, LGBT, LGBTQ, racial minorities, Muslims and Arabs, indigenous intellectuals. Um, Louis was always making space for other people. He was mentoring people who were excluded. And everybody who knew him knows that that's, uh, that was central to what he, that it, what he did. We all have to step up to the plate and do, do more of that. And then uh, finally, I, I just wanted to say this, uh, one of the things that, that I think we have to think about uh, is this sort of uh, compromise and internal critique uh, of the left. Like, uh, like Russell and Fromm, uh, Louis was not afraid to be part of the left. Uh, he was very much fighting political battles uh, on the, uh, you know, as part of the left and fighting, fighting the, you know, basically fighting the right. Uh, but he was always willing to make compromises. He always talked to people who he didn't agree with. He was always learning from people he didn't agree with. Uh, he wasn't a cheerleader for his own side or he knew where he stood and he defended where he stood. He was willing to critique people on his own side and critique people on the left. And in an era when we're seeing deplatforming speakers and, uh, and people are trying to uh, stop people we, we don't agree with and are, are offensive and some, people, some of those people are deeply problematic, uh, these issues of free speech and academic freedom uh, come up. Um, and I do think that uh, uh, consistent with this uh, kind of public intellectual tradition, Russell, Fromm, and Louis represent a tradition that uh, uh, calls for us to defend uh, free exchange uh, because the case of Russell is a case where uh, it is sort of, it is liberal, liberal freedoms as inadequate as they are. We need a lot more, we have to go beyond liberal freedoms, but liberal freedoms protect people from, uh, to make the kind of dissent that, uh, that Russell and others uh, do, and then we need to, we're called again to do, to, to be dissenting. So, so thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to thank Bruce for putting together this really beautiful and inspiring room and the gallery and Vivian and Carol for bringing us together. Um, and you all for coming. Um, so what I, I'm, it was unclear to me why I was here because I know next to nothing about Russell. Um, so I thought I should speak as a, but I will try to tell some Russell stories because not everybody will know them and I was asked not to but it only seems to be following Russell's example to begin by breaking the rules um, <laughs> or at least not following the instructions. But what I really want to talk about is a side of Russell's contribution, which I think is completely underappreciated. We tend to think with images like this one of Russell as the lone conscientious objector, the dissident, the speaker of truth to power. And it reinforces an image we have of the dissident as a fundamentally moral, solitary person. And I think not only that that's in certain ways mistaken, um, but it's not true to Russell's deepest contribution. And I'm going to want to argue to the contrary that Russell was in fact a great builder of political institutions. So that's my contribution as a political scientist. So the one quote that I took as my inspiration for this is over on the wall, over, and I also want to thank Bruce for reminding us what a both humane and extremely witty 
man the third Earl Russell um, was. He was an Earl, of course. Um, and it is, I would never die for my beliefs because I might be wrong. <laughs> um, and Russell was wrong again and again and again. And we know this um, because he published so much. He published a book a year for nearly every one of the 98 years that he lived. Um, and he wrote down all sorts of things, as I'll show, that he probably shouldn't have. But he also lived long enough that um, he was able to correct his opinions. So I think imagining Russell as someone speaking truth to power might be less important than imagining him as the sort of person who was in, interested in starting the sort of conversations and building the kinds of institutions that could go on and discover later truths and find different ways of asserting power. So that, that's, what I, that's what I want to um, focus on. So I'll start with the cell here. And this is a question just for, um, because I, my understanding was that the equivalent cell in Brixton was in fact full of books. And not only that, but Russell, because he was Russell, uh, was able to have his own food sent in. Right. Um, and another one, and you spe Bruce specifically requested that we don't mention Russell's personal life, but I can't avoid it because it's <laughs> relevant um, on many descriptions of his time in jail. Um, uh, it is mentioned that he appreciated the solitude, not only because he had decent meals and his own library and was able to engage in some serious scholarly work, um, but also because it was a break from his um, extreporous personal life where he was conducting simultaneously four adulterous affairs, um, <laughs> which he continued by letter from, from inside the <laughs> jail. Um, but this becomes relevant to the, to the story I'm going to tell. Um, so one of, Neil mentioned Russell's um, having at several times uh, lost appointments, having been fired from various universities. Um, the first time was for Cambridge for his um, anti-war activism um, during the course of the uh, First World War. But the second and more remarkable was for a book that followed directly on the anecdote I just related that I perhaps shouldn't have mentioned, which was a book he felt was the immediate cause for his, his having been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950. And this is a 1929 book called Marriage and Morals, um, in which he takes all sorts of incredibly forward-thinking um, stands. It argues for an, a total liberalization of divorce laws. It argues for the end of any sort of sanction for um, for premarital sex. It even calls, um, uh, and this was a lifelong cause for Russell, for the decriminalization of homosexuality, which Russell actually lived long enough to see. Um, so sometimes just by sticking around, um, you, can, you can end up on the winning, on the winning side. Um, so as I say, when Russell won the Nobel Prize for Literature in in 1950, he thought that marriage and morals might have been the single greatest um, reason for that, because it had a huge role in his, in his public reputation, because it was such a radical book, and much more so than his famous um, atheism, which was actually the reason that Cambridge didn't protect him during World War I. It was from Cambridge's point of view, not fundamentally about pacifism. Um, it is also the reason he got fired from a university for the second time. He was fired from the City College of New York in 1940, not because of his pacifism, because of course the United States had officially in 1940 decided to sit World War II out. That was the policy. He was fired because of marriage and morals and because of its gross public advocacy of um, indecency. Um, <laughs> He was not fired because of the entire chapter in Marriage and Morals devoted to eugenics, which was, at the time he published it, totally uncontroversial. Um, and it included sentences which he struck from later editions, something you also get to do if you live long enough, such as, in extreme cases, there can be little doubt of the superiority of one race to another. And he goes on and on and on. 
He later, of course, struck that and corrected that he didn't mean on the basis of genetic endowment. He rather meant under the civilizational um, conditions permitted um, under imperial, Western imperial domination, and so on. If we go, if we go back to the pamphlets that got, um, that got Russell jailed um, in the course of World War I, we will also find him supporting um, colonialism during the course of World War I on the basis that it might have an improving effect, a sort of um, utilitarian argument in favor of colonialism. So Russell was frequently and extravagantly wrong. Um, and he was quite happy to admit he was wrong, and he had lots of time to change his mind. So I don't think we should be devoted to Russell as a spokesman of truth. And I don't think he'd want to be um, remembered as a spokesman of truth. Instead, I suggested we should remember him as a founder of institutions. And I want to describe, in conclusion, two such institutions. Um, the first one um, has actually a Nova Scotia connection. Yes. Yeah, and it is the Pugwash Conferences. Mm -hmm. So this came out of Russell's joint statement with Albert Einstein in 1955, the Russell-Einstein Manifesto, um, which was one of an early call for um, nuclear disarmament, which was a nice, a very moral thing to do. But out of this call and out of the money that Sire, the Canadian Cyrus Eaton gave to forward their initiative, came a whole series of conferences that became um, the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. Um, and what these did is gathered scientists in order to essentially refute the arguments made by politicians against disarmament. So governments and generals would say, no, we can't possibly give up our weapons because then there are all sorts of practical strategic reasons. And what um, the people gathered by Russell started doing and continued doing long after he was gone was bringing together international teams of scientists to say, no, in fact, we can have verification. No, in fact, we can solve all of these practical problems. As I say, the, that is a set of institutions, an international set of institutions connected to no government, um, although supported by people like Cyrus Eaton. It right. helps to have um, such connections. Um, that continues um, its work today and was in 1995 um, given a Nobel Peace Prize. And part of me would like to think that that Nobel Peace Prize might mean more to Russell than his Nobel Prize for literature. So that's the first um, institution. The second institution, which probably more people here are familiar with, are the Russell Tribunals, um, the first of which was convened in 1966 in Stockholm to try the United States for war crimes or crimes against humanity in Vietnam. In fact, Russell himself, probably incorrectly, wanted to charge um, uh, Lyndon Johnson himself, but that was prevented by Swedish law. Um, but the important thing about the Russell Tribunal, the first of which was convened in 66 and then the next year as well in Denmark, is that although they functioned like a court, they tried to represent as many different people, although all far lefties naturally, um, they observed the, tried to observe the functions of impartiality and fairness that courts observed, but they had no connection to any state. Sweden was simply the host place. And since then, there have been Russell tribunals um, around the world that operated on a, sim a, um, on a similar format. There were, um, ultimately, the Russell tribunal headed, as you, some of you know, by Jean-Paul Sartre, who Russell agreed uh, to um, allow as head, Russell at this point was 94, he was too old, um, but he knew that Sartre had a huge international following, even though it was peddling what, from Russell's point of view, was precisely the sort of idealist nonsense that Russell had hoped to chase out of philosophy in the 1920s. Um, nevertheless, um, he made this sort of ally precisely in order to have a public impact and in order to be heard. So the idea was to gather the evidence, put together 
a record as impartial as possible of what the Americans were doing in Vietnam and make that available to the world, not to seek any state sanction or, um, or instruments to enforce their verdicts, but rather to put the evidence and the verdicts before the court of world opinion. Um, since then, there have been other, and since Russell's death, there have been other tribunals um, having to do with the Latin American dictatorships, Iraq, Palestine, psychiatry. Now there's one um, gathered to, to hear the facts on Ukraine. These are often controversial, um, and they may frequently be wrong, as Russell himself was wrong. But what they represent, and this is what I want to end with, is another way of doing politics, a way of politics that does not revolve around gaining state power, which you may never do, um, and does not also principally revolve around being right, which Russell frequently was not, but rather around convoking institutions that can hope to outlast oneself in order to pursue some sort of truth, justice, and peace. Very impressive. And uh, I'd like to thank James, Neil, and Virginia very much for approaching in a very powerful way so many of the themes that are <coughs> between the lines, <laughs> some of them openly represented in the quotes around the room and in the videos. At this time, I would like to open the floor because with all of the reading rooms that I've uh, <clears throat> produced over the years, we've always had these open discussions. Some have ended up in arguments, uh, critical arguments which can be life-saving. Um, one of the symptoms of an approaching nervous breakdown is the belief that one's work is terribly important. <laughs> That's one of the quotes on the wall. Another is, which invokes a great Greek myth. I'll leave you to think of that, because it's a video that I'm not showing here, but I'm going to put on social media. The observer, when he seems to himself to be observing a stone, is really, if physics is to be believed, observing the effects of the stone upon himself. It's a bit gendered, but I tried to keep out most of the quotes that are masculine in form. Because uh, if any of us lived to the ripe old age of 97, someone's going to come along and say, aha, in 1981 <laughs> you said this, and your obituary says something else. I'm very pleased that Neil invoked the good name of Lewis Greenspan because um, when I saw this obituary, um, I put it into this notebook that I have with all of the quotes and all of the references that are next door. You may know my accent as a New Zealand accent and uh, Sir David Lowe is a New Zealand Sir David Lowe next door was one of the caricaturists. One of the things that makes a celebrity is how many caricatures there exist of, of them. And Bertrand Russell had more than most. Of course, he can be critiqued in so many different ways and should be as an intellectual, as a writer, um, but the biggest critic was Bertrand Russell himself, of himself. That's why I felt he was uh, a very powerful thinker and the, uh, the Thinking Lodge in Pugwish is a place where you could all make a pilgrimage to Nova Scotia, 
Canada's ocean playground. <laughs> and you can see, in fact, he couldn't even go to the first meeting, uh, which was funded by uh, Eaton uh, because of his illness. He was working up to the last day of his life. And that's a powerful, powerful uh, uh, role model for many of us who, who wish to uh, make some changes in the world. We can't do them alone. He would be the first to acknowledge that that kind of, we don't need to go to jail. Although he produced some extraordinary work when he was in jail, incarcerated for six months. Wouldn't we all like to be able to have space of our own? Didn't folks the name of someone else? To the lighthouse. Anyway, first I'm going to allow, encourage you to ask questions of our presenters. So when I entered university at 39 years old, the one class I didn't persevere through was a peace studies class. When I entered that class, it was a three-hour lecture, and um, the students that presented um, their opinions in that, cor in that um, course, it was, a, it was a first or second year course, anyways, uh, they were filled with passion. These were international students who had lived through the actual crises and that they were speaking to. And I was a, you know, a married white woman, uh, lived in Canada um, my whole life, and I was overwhelmed with um, the, the level and the detail and the passion that they presented. And so I immediately dropped that class and, <laughs> uh, and, and, and persevered through all of the other classes that I, I went on, so uh, that I went through. So when we're thinking about what intellectual means and what public intellectual means and what intelligence means and whether the state should stay out of the bedroom, which is what many of the people in the 60s were, were fighting for. Um, and, um, and at that period of time when um, eugenics was you know, uh, mixed up with evolutionary theories that we, we still have like a, 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 um, a legacy that we're still trying to uh, work through and um, intelligence quotes, you know, measurements and so on. So, so when, when, um, when we're speaking about it um, through, uh, through, as a public intellectual and through intellectual writings, we're addressing something different when we're um, uh, talking about that lived experience of people who are in the crisis. And, and I, I feel like, um, <coughs> anyways, that was my, that's my statement for, uh, the question is at one point at what point does the university become the center for engagement or should it become the center for engagement for the solution of these kinds of problems and it's an old one it's an old one uh, we have so many ways to get involved now in McMaster because we've had a president who's been very open to these very questions um, but it is confusing. You know, at what point do you get involved in that debate, I think? Neil did not talk about Atif Kabursi, who was the other half of Louis Greenspan. And those two went on for two decades. They had um, uh, conversations, they'd pull together, they would go to classes together, they taught classes, they had forums on campus. One stood on the side of the Arabs and one stood on the side of Jews and then they'd switch sides. <laughs> right? So, I mean, the environment has changed radically at the university. That was a didactic, but it was an engaged pedagogy. Our kinds of approaches to these things, these questions are very confused. And so we have concophony. Cacophony on the campuses, and it's disturbing. It's disturbing to students, I suspect. As it is disturbing to us, how do we find our way through this? So I, I'm, it's a response, not an answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Of, um, Bertrand Russell devoted his life towards um, articulating how to combat peace, but today we're 
is saturated in a world filled with binaries, where it's only one idea, um, if you're with us or against us. And I, I wonder, my question is, um, what inspires, um, what from Bertrand Russell inspires you as individuals specifically to combat that binary? Because these are people who won't necessarily listen to you and don't care to listen to you. And Bertrand Russell advocated for peace and for pacifism in the face of people that don't care about pacifism. Um, and so, so what about Bertrand Russell ins has inspired um, each of you as individuals to combat that mentality of binaries within, uh, that is so pervasive and, and has continued to be per pervasive throughout society? We would like to respond to that. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I could be that certain when I talked about um, yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic point, and it's really what I tried to speak to. Um, and so the, the lesson from Russell should not be that he was a great philosopher and a very wise man and arrived at all sorts of truths, moral truths, that he then defended against power. And I think that's far too often the sort of lesson we take this heroizing image of wise men, they're almost always men, who, who fight power. I think we get this, um, and I think it's misleading in the case of almost all the individuals to whom it's applied. Um, um, a very similar argument could be had about uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who ended up um, losing more than he won and trying to build movements all over the place. Um, so. The best way, Russell, in fact, leaves us not only an image of, um, of, of standing up to power, indeed, and going to jail for it, but I think much more important of the willingness to be wrong, to speak even if you later have to correct what you're saying, but, and defending your position nevertheless, but recognizing that those positions may change and trying to build spaces in which that sort of dialogue can be constructive the way it was here and the way it decreasingly is in the binarized, polarized, moralized politics that we tend to see today. Sure. I mean, I, I came um, uh, out of the, the democratic socialist tradition, and I'm still in this tradition. But uh, one thing that I've always been struggling with and inspired by with, with uh, Bertrand Russell is it seems to me he's an example of how you, you, uh, you need uh, responsible elites who yeah. can play. We should be critiquing elites, elites as much as we can, but you also need, and looking down south of us right now, you see when, what happens when, uh, as we critique elites, that's good, but what happens when you have a, the alternative sometimes is much worse. So I think we need to find a way of uh, allowing for critiques of elites, but also dialogues with, inform with the responsible elites and, and responsible conservatives and conservative with principle. He, he, Russell wasn't a, a conservative, but we have to expand on it. And, and exactly, the Atif and, and Louis, that kind of dialogue it was, is really something we have, right. to bring, we have to bring back. Lifelong learning. <laughs> Lifelong learning. But also, I had a student come into a, from, he was graduating, he said to me, Dr. Oxon, I'm leaving with more questions than, uh, than I arrived leaving with more questions than when I arrived. And I said, well, I've done my job. Yeah. And Russell should have the last word on this. Yes. Uh, because he always believed in the tertium quid. The third thing that for which this text was written. And you can find this in many of the quotes around the room. For example, the megalomaniac differs from the narcissist, there's a binary for you, <laughs> by the fact that he wishes to be powerful rather than charming, and seeks to be feared rather than loved. To this type belong many lunatics and most of the great men of history. <laughs> so he's very inclusive. <laughs> Would he include himself in uh, this? Mm. Mm, no. Maybe not. <laughs> but as, uh, as we recognize the good life is one inspired by love and guided by knowledge. To conquer fear is the beginning of wisdom. But um, men are born ignorant, not stupid. 
they are made stupid by education. I think we should stop there <laughs> <laughs> and thank everyone.